academia. And basically, this is a, dis a distribution that runs almost all Harvard's uh, faculty and projects and, and uh, professors. And this is currently used in other universities uh, as well, Stanford and the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and so on and so on. The second thing that we're doing with another company, a Belgian company called the Plexer, this is we are building the new version for a site called Capacity for Dev. This is for the European Commission. It's a pretty exciting, uh, a pretty exciting uh, distribution that is meant for knowledge sharing for people who are dealing delegates or dealing with uh, projects in developing countries. In the screenshot, you can see that this is, I, I call it very 2015 in the sense that you know adding the knowledge, which is what this platform is for, is made with AngularJS and, and fancy stuff. The reason that we are in all those uh, distributions is mainly due to the fact that we are the uh, authors and, the, and maintainers of different models such as organic groups and the entity reference and the message stack and RESTful and so on and so on. So, thank you. All right, so next is Doug. All right, hi guys, I'm Doug Marcy, VP of Products for Phase 2. Uh, currently we have Open Atrium and Open Public as our main actively maintained distributions. You've probably heard of at least one of them. Um, phase 2 has been doing a lot with distributions for a very long time, back into the Drupal 6 days, back to 2007 with Tatler and then Open Publish, moving into Drupal 7, working on Open Public based on some of the work we've done with government agencies, and then updating Open Publish. We also were part of the... the uh, co-funders, if you will, for some of the work that was done on Drupal.org to support better tooling around installation profiles and distributions. Most recently, we've released 2.0 versions of our Open Atrium and 1.0 of Open Public. Right, so, Ryan? Oh, nice. Yeah, I sort of prepared for the people I knew that were going to be here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I am Ryan from Commerce Guys. Um, I created Ubercart um, with a friend uh, before I got into Drupal full-time um, and founded Commerce Guys with a couple of gentlemen who are no longer with us, um, not because they died, but because we had to get rid of them. So, <laughs> um, we didn't agree on so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and at uh, Commerce Guys, we created Drupal Commerce, um, which was kind of like my next iteration on e-commerce in Drupal. Um, and it was built from scratch on Drupal 7, um, which means it was very much like a, like a framework of e-commerce functionality components that you could kind of string together to create an e-commerce website. Um, but it's therefore difficult to use for the average merchant who's used to paying $20 a month to Shopify and getting the world. Um, so we created a distribution of Drupal called Commerce Kickstart. Um, oh, look at that. Slick. Um, and this is this is Commerce Kickstart on the screen, um, and it was it was our attempt to solve um, that sort of out of the box uh, shock um, that people had in installing Drupal Commerce. So by presenting something that looked and felt like an e-commerce application um, that optimized the administrative interfaces for on-site management of a largely like physical product catalog, on-site order management, et cetera, et cetera. So smaller merchants that were shipping physical goods and might have like faceted product search and things like that. All of these things are hard to configure. The, the way we build the product pages, it can be difficult to, to configure if you aren't familiar with Drupal and entities and the inline entity form module and views mega row and all this stuff. So um, the distribution does that out of the box um, so that you don't have to. And then people have used it um, to launch you know, a wide number of sites. Um, some of them do a one-click installer on Pantheon and go, you know, and oftentimes they'll customize the theme or maybe not even. Um, or the other thing that people do with it is use it as a recipe book. So the distribution is a learning tool to expose them to new modules, new ways to configure Drupal Commerce, um, or even just like understanding the possibilities. Um, and I guess the, the final reason we did it was we wanted to, to, to create a self-sufficient um, R&D practice within Commerce Guys. Um, and so Commerce Kickstart gave us the vehicle um, to take modules to an audience. So if thousands of people were downloading it and testing it and installing it and then using it to build sites, we could expose thousands of people to Authorize.net and PayPal and Nosto and Avalar, et cetera, et cetera. And these companies are, are willing to basically fund the module development. So 
you know, PayPal says, here's $20,000, go integrate these APIs, and, you know, for every customer you bring to us, you'll get, you know, nine basis points on PayPal transactions, whatever, you know, however it works out, not to be too specific. Um, but the idea is that that now funds um, Boyan Zivanovich's full-time salary so that he can focus specifically on Drupal Commerce 2. Um, so the distribution has been good both for our users, for our customers, for our sales team, and now for our bottom line. Cool. So uh, I'll be quick uh, about myself. Um, architect and tech lead at Acquia. I work in our pre-sales organization. And um, basically what I do is I work on um, a distribution called Lightning, which is a base distribution. And then um, I work on a larger project that is called the Demo Framework. We use the Demo Framework to uh, basically compile modules from all the distributions that have been mentioned so far, plus other things to show people Drupal. And um, then we sort of turn this around with for, for customer implementations. We provide uh, Lightning as a, a platform for them to build upon. So the screenshots shown here are just a couple of uh, example demos that we run on the demo framework and the, uh, the demo that comes with Lightning. So people that uh, download Dev Desktop or use Acquia Cloud can spin up uh, Lightning sites and get started with editorial workflows and um, all of the Spark tools and D8 backports and um, a lot of other cool stuff that you'll see from panels and, and uh, workbench moderation. So check it out. Uh, my name's Matt Cheney. I work at Pantheon doing a lot of different things, but specifically I focus a lot of my time over the last five years on Drupal distributions. I, I got into it doing um, a distribution called COD back in the Drupal 5 days before we had features and before it became much more awesome. Um, and then I, uh, for more recently, I've been working with David Snowpack and others on the Panoply distribution, which is a base distribution that folks like Open Atrium and Open Berkeley can use to actually develop uh, really cool sort of distributions themselves. And then, as Ryan mentioned a little bit at Pantheon, I'm also really excited about creating one-click installs for distributions, so that you can go to a URL and click a button, and you can have you know many of the distributions we'll talk about spin up in a matter of you know minutes and be able to try it. Because uh, I'm a pretty big believer that you know if we want Drupal to continue to grow as a project and run you know double-digit percentage of the internet, we need these kind of like out-of-the-box solutions for people to use, and we need good tooling within that. And so it'll be fun to talk about all that stuff with everyone today. Jacob, cool. And I'm uh, Jacob Perry. I'm a Drupalist with the Drupal Association. Uh, I've sort of taken on some of the work with uh, the conference organizing distribution, otherwise known as COD, um, as well as Drupal Commons, um, back, uh, which does groups type uh, stuff. Um, so we're working on also Drupal.org, which has its own uh, implementation of distributions. So, um, yeah, we uh, right now COD got to 250 installs um, in the seven and over 500 people using the COD support. And it's interesting to see the difference between the, the modules people are using um, in the, the distribution versus the distribution itself. But, um, yeah, it's pretty cool as a, as a way to build original site like from scratch. Cool. All right, so um, we're going to jump into questions sort of that were covered in the description, as it were, uh, for this uh, little meeting of the minds. And so I'm going to start out with um, a question that is sort of like the big what's happened over the past five years and, um, you know, what, what has happened to the Drupal distribution ecosystem as a result of the work that's been done. And I think I want to direct this one probably to Jacob, actually, since he just had the mic. I think we had a lot of interesting um, hopes for, like, you could take something out of the box five years ago and it would just, like, magically run. And today we've turned that into a let's get you almost there and let you run the rest of the way. I think um, Commons is a good example of that. Um, and, and seeing how Lightning and Demo Framework have taken on from that is a, is a good evolution of that. Um, with COD, we're sort of struggling between this idea of do we give everyone this conference site uh, that gives you the flexibility that you need while at the same time giving you the custom customization that you want and that's been very difficult. And I think coming in the next version of COD, we're actually going to make, we're going to separate panels and views and all these things that people have been customizing and say, 
here's an example, go run with it, but upgrade paths and stuff like that. They don't work like they did five years ago. They're not what we thought they would do five years ago. So also, um, Matt, five years ago, there weren't services like, um, you know, Pantheon or Acquia Cloud or any of the other number of uh, platform SH, um, any of the other number of sort of like uh, quick deployment platforms for development. And, you know, what is what is that change for distributions? Yeah, so I would say, so that's, I mentioned working on the Drupal 5 version of COD, which was basically Web4 module sort of hacked up with um, a lot of like PHP module, P or PHP code to do variable sets. And we ended up in a place where we needed to deploy that working for NASA to initially develop it. And, you know, it wasn't that easy to spin up. There wasn't features, configuration and code was just the PHP I had written. And we ended up doing a lot of like database dumps just to get stuff, you know, sort of staged. And I feel one of the changes I've seen in five years is that we do have this much better tooling, these it's hosting platforms that can that can deploy stuff, that we have modules like features that can store more configuration and code. And I think one thing which was mentioned earlier, we also have a lot more emerging practices of how to do this kind of stuff. That, you know, when you're sort of starting off and there weren't a lot of Drupal distributions out there, you're sort of like just trying stuff to get it to work. And now I think as we see more patterns and we have more people building on top of base distributions, we get a little bit a little bit more energy from that. So um, I guess anyone that wants to pick up the ball and run with this can do so. Otherwise, I could speak to it as well. But what are some of the challenges that we're looking at for the next five years? You know, in, in 2020, what are we going to be looking at with Drupal and distributions and out-of-the-box solutions like these? Upgrade path. Upgrade path, yeah. <laughs> I think that a big thing that has really sort of hinged the development of, of distributions as we've known it so far has a lot to do with the features module and how that sort of deploys uh, different features onto sites. And the way that we see CMI working in um, Drupal 8 and knowing sort of how the life cycle of Drupal has been going, we're hoping that we'll be seeing a lot of features coming into um, Drupal 8 as you know semantic versioning has been introduced. We'll see more and more tools for configuration deployment, and hopefully, I think that will lead to a much faster deployment process, not just for you know out of these out of the box sites, but just in general having better starting points. And, and even CMI doesn't solve this like pretty important problem, and we have it in Drupal Commerce and in Kickstart, um, which of course is what happens when somebody overrides your default configuration. But I want to make a change, like in the base definition of a view that you need to have. So like, if I'm adding a new um, area handler to the header of a view, to, ba to, to give like a much better, um, you know, user experience for order administrators. If you've customized that view at all, you will never see this come into your site. And additionally, like the only way for you to ever see it would be to revert it and blow away any customization you've already made. And that's that's a that's a pretty big challenge. I mean, that that involves not just an upgrade path, but even like like diffing and you know merging and changes. And that's that's it's a challenge. Matt's got it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, one other thing I'd add, just to the um, in. One other thing I'd add sort of the next five years is that um, as sort of Jacob mentioned, like having the idea of just you get something out of the box and that's all you really need is hasn't been very real. What I think is becoming more real is developing tooling where you can get, you know, that 80% and then in the UI you can actually configure your way to what you want. And so things like the panels IPE, where you can drag and drop stuff around and do kind of stylizing configurations, very powerful. Spark has a lot of really good edit in place functionality. And I think that as distribution, as we have more tools that let end users make real configuration to their site, we have a lot more options to roll something out that can be done with, without code can take you to a live website. And I think that's, to me, that's a really important goal to be able to develop those kind of solutions. But we've had to build a lot of that architecture and those sort of building blocks to get there. And I think we'll talk about some of that today. I think tagging on to that, I think overall an interesting problem for distributions in Drupal is that they sort of follow from contrib, which follows from core. And by the time we're getting into them, that feedback loop, those, those little architectural changes, be they things like being able to inherit profiles and stuff like that, like it doesn't make it back upstream in time. And I, 
I'm actually really heartened with D8, seeing so many people jumping on in the beta time and getting you know the core modules and things up to date. But it's still going to be an interesting problem for us going forward as we get into, dare I say, a Drupal 9 and things like that. Like, how do we make it so that distributions, which are becoming increasingly a way that people jump into Drupal because it gives them that kickstart, are still represented and able to kind of give that feedback to help people, you know, to help us develop them and make them more stable and make them more powerful and configurable and things like that. Yeah, so maybe what we'd hope to see is a better upgrade path and a way for people to continue to use the components and things that are provided by distributions without being hindered by them. So um, this is sort of stepping, taking things back up another le like higher level, but there's talk about, um, I'm sorry, there's talk about like install profiles and then there's distributions. And when we think about, you know, what are, what makes up a distribution versus an install profile and, you know, what are some of the immediate benefits that we can pull from, from both of those things and using those things, um, can you speak to that? Sure. So indeed, I think when we're saying distributions, um, we actually mean two different things. So distribution, similar to what Jacob was saying, that five years ago when we said distribution, it wasn't just a technical thing. It was like kind of a business plan that every company could have their own distribution, which is like, you know, they can sell and profit or whatever, even give for free. But it will, what we're saying that a distribution right now in terms of technology, it's just the starting point, what we're talking about, the upgrade path. It's it just, you know, you install it and that's it. You're, you're, you're on your own, basically. So there is this, there was that idea and I think that uh, I don't want to say that it failed, but it, di it did not succeed. <laughs> uh, but there is something important that came from it and that's the installation profile. So it's actually the same thing, but a, a different mindset of looking at it. And the, the installation profile is basically uh, in a way we, we call it a codified knowledge base. And, and I'd like to explain. Every company, you know, a bunch of developers are sitting and every developer once a day or once a week, they figure out something silly, but that was really important for them. And now how do they share it? So writing on the wiki will take them some time. And the problem is nobody will read it. Maybe one wiki article, but nobody will read 400 wiki articles and it's so like diverse. Installation profile and the fact that we can have a make file and exported code and everything basically means that me as the developer, if I found out something that is worthwhile to add to this distribution, to this installation profile, if I've written a patch and it was not merged yet, I can put that patch in, that patch in the make file so the next time we are provisioning a new, a new installation profile, or if somehow we are rerunning the Drush Make, then we are actually earning from, from previous knowledge. And that's why we call it codified knowledge base, because you don't really need to be aware of it. It's like in the version, in the version control. Ryan, do you have something to say about it? <laughs> I agree. <laughs> no, at, uh, at Commerce Guys, for example, we have this issue where um, much of, of what we do to build e-commerce sites is like oral tradition. And if you don't happen to be sitting by the person who did it before, or if that person goes to work somewhere else, like we lose a part of our history. And so being able to codify this and then reuse it and use that as a starting point for each successive project is very important for us. So, so we at, uh, for Drupal.org and for all of our sub-sites, this is sort of, we, we actually don't allow you to, uh, commit to the built repo of the websites, you have to use the install profile. So we build an install profile that's a sub-install profile from uh, COD that takes in our changes and takes in our patches and all that. And the really awesome thing about that is, yeah, it can be a little more annoying when you're really trying to develop rapidly, but you shouldn't be doing that anyway. So um, having that type of information to know exactly how this site is being built and re repeat it is an immense benefit. And it's really helped us get everyone on board so everyone knows, uh, everyone has the same site, everyone knows what's patched, and we know when there are conflicts. So that's been really awesome. Yeah. I think, um, just to tag on to what Amato was saying, I think another interesting thing about this, especially as we mentioned before with features, is 
with the distributions and the install profiles, being able to install good configurations. And it's providing best practices and knowledge, not just for developers looking at the PHP code of the modules, but for site builders and other maintainers that are looking at those pre-created views, those page layouts, those other extensions, how you've laid out your content types, what you know, widgets you're using, all those kinds of little details can be captured. And someone can learn a lot just by going through and looking at you know, what you've done and you say this is the right way to do it. It's, it's step by step more you know, the, with features and features override and features template, the ability to have that configuration come with it is another great le learning resource for people beyond developers. Yeah, and you know, I see a lot of stuff going on with make files where, in essence, I feel like it's, when I first started looking at distributions, it was almost opening up um, the doors to the sausage factory as to how this stuff is actually getting made, and we see a lot of distributions, almost every distribution that I've looked at recently that is, you know, maintained and used often has core patches and also has patches for modules and typically runs on dev versions of modules where if you were to go and say download the six, eight modules that you need to say just use the panels IPE that Matt was talking about in the way that you'd expect to with fieldable panel panes, you might need dev versions with specific checkouts, not just the green download tarball. So this is really jump starting and putting people way further ahead than you know they could possibly be by just trying to recreate some of that tribal knowledge uh, through reading docs. So uh, yesterday I had uh, together with uh, Josh from Pantheon a session about decoupled Drupal. This is something that is also like, not just a buzzword, this is uh, in fact, some people are uh, doing it. And we see that now Drupal is also acting, it's yet another component in something bigger. You can have client-side, you can have Node.js and whatnot. And one of the solutions that, that we've provided, we created a Yeoman generator. Like a, 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 um, it's a JavaScript library that allows you to scaffold different projects. So there is this Hadley generator project that we added that scaffolds headless Drupal. So basically even the idea of a distribution is again kind of a mindset of how I can uh, bundle together a set of features. So basically I think the, the, the distribution idea is indeed, um, it al allows us to bundle together best practices. And once we follow those best practices and we do it daily, then after that it trickles down to to all the other other stuff that we're doing. So we're, even if I'm now dealing with different technologies, I have the same mindset of, well, I need to somehow bundle it together so I'm able to automatically and repeatedly um, build it over and over again. Yeah, so it's in nicely. Last thing I'll tag on. So phase two is a services company. Our primary gig is to you know, build websites for people. And the other great thing the distributions do for us is allow us to not be building the same things over and over again. Basically, I know that sounds pretty simple, right? But it's actually something that we fell into doing. You talk about over the last five years of distributions and the idea of sort of an out-of-box experience versus a good starting point. That good starting point is a very powerful tool for people that are building websites for other people. Do you really want to be spending all your time talking to your client about what the blog should look like on the site? Or do you want to be jumping into what's unique about their business? What's the true value add for the website and things like that? And so for us with distributions, like as another type of user, you know, the actual development team that are just getting somebody jump started, getting them set up, it's a really powerful feature set to be able to say, no, we don't have to worry about that first. Let's go and let's focus on what makes your business special and then we can come back and tweak that if we need to. So um, might as well hold on to the mic, Doug, because this sort of like continues off of that thought, but have distributions introduced, you know, to new organizations to Drupal that wouldn't have otherwise adopted the platform? Yeah, I was going to jump on this because I, I, I actually, um, you know, I heard a I initially hadn't worked with Drupal before I came to Phase 2, and I was kind of surprised because I had heard of some other things that, that uh, Phase 2 had done, specifically open public in the government space. And it was sort of an interesting thing for me to realize that when people come to Drupal, they hear about it, they hear it's a really powerful platform. It can actually be a little daunting for folks to kind of think about using it as a platform. And then when they hear that, oh, there is already a commerce distribution that's really tailored to that, I won't have to build that out of box. Or in the government space, when I hear there's open public and someone's already thought about these problems that I've had before, or in the collaboration space with Atrium, it, it really helps them to kind of get over that hump of fear and to look at it and say, well, you know, maybe it is worthwhile for me to have this more powerful platform, this more structured content, et cetera, because I'm not going to be starting from scratch. And 
the number of times we've had people just you know be blown away by how helpful it was. You know, they they they've gone and they did a spin up of Drupal or they tried to download it and run it, and it's like, okay, great, but now what do I do? And having the distribution spin up and give them a really nice environment right away makes them just feel know, warm and fuzzy about the whole experience. And it brings people into the platform that otherwise would have been scared away. Um, and we've had that happen over and over again. Oh yeah, I mean, one thing I, I'd tack onto that that I think is sort of, that Dries mentioned in his keynote a couple days ago is that one of the things that really made Drupal successful as a project was that there was a political distribution called Dean Space for the Howard Dean campaign and then a sort of activism distribution called Civic Space after. And that there was a time, I mean, a while ago, but where more and more people searching for and downloading Civic Space than Drupal itself. And that there are people that came into the Drupal community working on something that they didn't even know was Drupal because they thought it was Civic Space, because it was Civic Space and that stuff. And I think that Drupal owes a lot to that kind of, that kind of process. But I feel people need something that speaks to them. Drupal doesn't really do a whole lot out of the box, you know, for someone who's not familiar with it. And being able to see something or demo something that looks more like what they want gets people interested in general. And I think that that was true for all of Drupal uh, through a couple of those distributions. Yep. Ditto. Ditto with, uh, with COD, we've seen people from uh, sectors who are not looking for Drupal specifically, but they were looking for a conference organizing you know, piece of software. And, and so when they found COD, uh, they see our splash page at Use COD, and they're like, oh, I'm looking at you know, conference organizing and not necessarily Drupal, uh, which is good and bad um, and because they get into it, and then we want to make sure the experience is as much not Drupal y, you know, as easy as to use. So, um, yeah, we're hoping uh, to continue that, and I think that will bring more people into Drupal through um, all the different distributions. Yeah, definitely. If I could tack on one little anecdote, too, just what, looking at what we've done with the demos that we've been building um, and the time to delivery that we've been able to provide. Uh, even in the case of um, CMS competition, so we are going up against say, WordPress or Adobe CQ5 with um, you know organizations, and we're happy to jump into a let's build a POC competition with them because we know that we have something like Lightning, which is built on the Drupal community's great contributions, but it's a distribution that we can install right away and have up and running and themed and basically you know kicking those other platforms' asses, for lack of a better term, um, very quickly in a very short period of time. And we've seen that that then leans, l lends itself to them saying, well, how did you guys do this so quickly and getting them excited? And then what we've seen then is them building their own profiles and distributions to deploy, you know, 30 some odd sites for the organization within a few months. Um, you know, they've got their first couple of sites up and running. And none of that's possible without you know, something like distributions, install profiles, and make files. I, I actually had a question for Ryan. Um, so we had like a local guy doing a 4x4 shop who um, was looking for a better shopping experience. And, you know, I had to be very careful about how we say, um, you know, you're going to download Drupal, and he goes to drupal.org, and I'm like, wait, 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 no, no, no. Let's, let's look at Commerce Kickstart because that is a commerce tool. How Have you guys seen in your selling more commerce um Less Drupal. <laughs> like selling a commerce software instead of you know saying this is Drupal commerce versus we're selling a commerce. Yeah, tool. honestly, I mean, it's, it's kind of far afield, I guess, from like a distribution panel. But we we sell Drupal commerce, um, and we do use you know Commerce Kickstart to demo the capabilities of the software. Um, but uh, you know, Drupal is our differentiator. Otherwise, somebody should just use Shopify, basically. Um. I think, um, kind of tagging onto that a little bit, I mean, one of the things that we've seen with our distributions is really it expanding the mind space that Drupal occupies for people when they see that it is possible to do that, that someone has gone and built, you know, a really solid distribution around commerce, a really solid distribution around internet, you know, social collaboration and things like that. People tend to sometimes think, okay, Drupal's for good websites and maybe my intranet, I'll, I'll put it out there so I can publish some websites internally, you know, some web pages internally, but they don't necessarily know everything it can do. And in that way, I think distributions are also a great gateway just to the contrib and the depth of modules that are available for Drupal. I think there's just so much there. And unless you have 
been in the community and you have that encyclopedic knowledge of what all the moving parts are, and I'm sure up here we could rattle off hundreds of modules, but most people can't do that. And having it go, oh, you can do that. Like, we've heard that very often in our demos. And it's, uh, it's a really powerful moment because it gets people kind of, again, to go, oh, Drupal can do that and gets us into whole new areas. I think that one of the, the, the things with distribution is also who is behind the distribution. So some distribution or even most distribution, I see them as uh, kind of uh, lead generators, meaning you, you wrote something, somebody will be interested in that, that's your foot you're foot at the door, and from there you're, you're selling uh, services. There are a few distributions. I think COD is one of them. I think that Open Scholar by Harvard is one of them, which usually, if I look at it, I think it's when you have a business entity and uh, a non-profit a non entity behind it. COD, Open Scholar, I can think of a, a few more are actually real distribution in the sense that they are trying to provide the product as a product and not necessarily the service. Commerce Kickstart, for example, l looks and feels more as a lead generator. It's very fancy, but you probably won't install it and start selling tomorrow. So you're either going to be your own developer and you're going to develop it, or you might call this guy and ask him for, for a price offer. Yeah, that's fair. Um, yeah, because I looking for an out of the box experience. Uh, you know, the people are looking for Shopify. I think the the problem that this this particular client saw was the limitations that that had. And so showing Commerce Kickstart and then saying, "Hey, you know, you can do this," and he starts rattling off a few things he says. And I'm like, "Oh yeah, we can do that because Drupal can do that." And saying Commerce uh, having branding around that seems to be a good lead in to to start to go down the path of Drupal. So when we talk about, you know, Kickstart for, is a great example of being a place to begin on something and then, like Amitai said, sort of sometimes distributions looked at as lead generating. Um, but, you know, what are distributions providing and, and where are we succeeding in this space with regard to reusing components and, um, you know, the underlying modules that come with these distributions? I, let me let me start, and you can tag on, Matt, because I think I'm going to do a great lead-in for you. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> um, you know, one way at a, just a very gross level for us is Open Atrium is actually built on Panoply. We inherit the Panoply distro. We take all that great best practices and are then able to build Open Atrium on top of that. And that gave us, as a developer of a distribution, a great kickstart to be able to focus on what was important about our distribution. So that's a, a pretty extreme case, probably, but it's it's something that we've we've derived tons of benefits from being able to do that. Yeah. It's a coincidence because oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, so yeah, we plan this, somehow. and that's I mean that's basically the with the pitch with Panoply is hey we can build a set of reusable stuff that sort of Panoply was developed in the context of, of building a distribution called Open Atrium for universities, and at the time there was so much like code that was happening. It was all you know, the university thing is cool and has a lot of value, but like there's all this other stuff that we were working on that totally was just generalizable. And I think it was nice to put out that distribution on um, Panoply in a sort of generalized form because then people can work on that. And I think it also, it avoided one problem that I know has happened in the distribution space is that it's difficult if you have a distribution that's too tightly like coupled to the marketing of a particular business to get other people to really help with it. Because, it, you know, people often do distributions for marketing or for their, their business, which is, which is great. But that, you know, if you throw out something Panoply, which isn't really, a, it's not like a business case, it's more of like a helping Drupal case, you get other people to work on it, which I think is, is a, a, hard, a helpful part of having people reuse stuff. Um, I'd also say the case of, of a lot of the distributions, I think that a lot of modules get a lot more attention because distribution authors, I think, are some of the best developers and they're constantly reinstalling and getting a lot of user feedback from a whole range of different skill sets. And that, you know, because they're able to run stuff on dev versions and use patches and they have a strong interest in getting those patches accepted, I think that's pushed a lot of the development along. Um, I've absolutely seen that in the panel space. That's a module like Panelizer has gotten tons of attention from people because it's used by a bunch of different distributions and they want their patches to go in the main line so they're willing to put in extra effort to make that happen. So as a maintainer of panels and C-tools, um, 
yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it works great. Uh, the fact that when we're testing, um, nothing's like doing it live. Um, basically using distros as a, as a recipe of patches, which can be very difficult um, to figure out all the different patches and, and making them compatible with each other. Uh, we can look at the the build that panel that Panelopoly has, or COD has, or Commons has, and say, okay, this is working for us. Can we get this under you know needs review or RTBC? And so we've we've committed a lot of patches to panels and C tools in the last six months because of the work from distributions. Yeah, I think one you know specific thing that I've seen is that since joining Acquia and working on distributions full time, I've seen my contrib contribution go up. I think about seven thousand percent, and that's something that feels really good as a developer to know that the stuff that you're working on during the day is not just going to one client and you know in a private repo somewhere, but it's getting on Drupal.org and it's moving everybody forward, no matter you know what they're working on. So with that in mind, Drupal.org is one place that will find distributions, but how, how does increased usage of GitHub uh, affected the development of these things? Maybe, maybe someone whose distribution is living on GitHub. Well, <laughs> much better. I mean, yeah, I mean, I was imitating. Yeah. Basically, I think... I'm not excited about Drupal.org uh, since, since I've started working with GitHub, meaning writing patches and reviewing them with Dreditor. It's just it's not, not the right tool for me. And the fact that GitHub has this pull request and inline review and it's integrated with Travis, I don't think that in the end it really changes much the code itself. It just makes it more pleasant for the developers to work and, and collaborate. And something that I often say is that uh, developers' morale should not be underestimated. Because if I don't want to, if if it's going to be annoying to use Dreditor, and so many times Dreditor have completely killed my review. So you spend 10 minutes writing a review, and then it's gone. So after five times, I said. A curse word, and I moved yeah. to GitHub. I, I think the pull request alone has completely changed the way that you know we work at Acquia. When I look at even some of the professional services projects that I've um, you know been pulled into at times, um, where we've built out these install profiles that were using components from distributions, and we had people from partners and internal that were all doing pull requests on this large build that you had to run like a full stack application basically in order to even test out. And none of that was possible without the help of Travis, the help of you know the make files being able to be run and, and all of that together is possible with GitHub and not really something that is in a way, I think in my opinion, worth reinventing, um, which is something that I sort of see in Drupal.org is that we've, we've, we're iteratively adding Features and I think that the features that we've added that help contribution are great, but it's very hard for that organization to keep up with the features that people have sort of grown accustomed to through platforms like GitHub and Bitbucket. So just to add to, the, to that about Travis, distributions very uh, quickly become a monster in terms of, of coding. So you always want to add tests. So. I've seen it in Open Scholar. I've seen it in this uh, capacity for dev distribution for the EU. In Travis, we're not only installing the distribution itself. We're installing Apache Solar. We're installing a bunch of different, you know, things using Grunt and, and whatnot just to test it. And being able to do that means that we can concentrate on advancing with the development and not finding the bugs and, and starting to solve them. And that's, like, super important. Okay. Did anyone else have anything to add? Otherwise, I think that uh, we had at least one question out there. I wanted to open up Q&A. Well, do we, does anyone know where we're at with time as well? <laughs> I should have a timer. Oh, okay. So, what, so I'm going like to start 15? with a quick question about the GitHub thing, actually, because okay. I'm curious what this we'll panel says about this. Um, you know, you're still kind of dual homing your project, right? It still lives on Drupal.org and people are finding it there. Are you finding managing two issue queues and things like that is, is overhead for you or is it something that actually works out well when you have kind of clear sourcing for different types of requests and things like that? Who else want to expand? 
<laughs> yeah. So um, basically, also most of the models uh, of Gitra were ha have been moved into GitHub. So uh, OG and message stuff like that have actually indeed two two issue queues, which is pretty annoying to ignore both of them. <laughs> but RESTful model, for example, we use Drupal.org just to, uh, for the releases. The issue queue is turned off because indeed I want to have the drush over there to be able to drush download. Plus, once it's in Drupal.org, then the security team can audit it. And basically, that's the place for things to, to be. But in terms of development, we enjoy having it in, in GitHub. So same goes for, for uh, distribution. Open Scholar, for example, is developed solely on GitHub, but the distribution, but the release is sent there, so you can test it on Simply Test Me and so on. So, so uh, as someone who works for the association, um, uh, actually, I mean, I, I play both sides of this. Uh, we ran into an issue lately where um, licensing is an issue. So on Drupal.org, GPL2 is the, the norm. And so what if your distribution needs GPL3, a GPL3 library? And right now there's no way you can actually do that on Drupal.org. Um, and so, yeah, you're, you're limited to GitHub or some Bitbucket or some other third party. Um, the concern I have is, is fragmenting the community. Um, but we, it, it's definitely a problem, and I guess I should say on the plus side, uh, there was, there's another um, talk going on right now about uh, issue workspaces, uh, about improving Git work, uh, workflows, uh, doing pull requests, and things like that. So um, my hope is that actually uh, the issue queues and the, the development workflow for Drupal.org will get much better and in line with how people have been doing stuff um, in other uh, third-party services. So yeah, what? Well, yes. There is a debate about should we move to GitHub oh, yes. or should we oh, move yes. to Drupal. I'm on the side that says, well, the Drupal community should realize that we'll never be GitHub. And there is indeed a concern of let's not, uh, you know, fragmentize the community in one hand. On the other hand, the fact that code in Drupal.org doesn't, doesn't keep me there necessarily. So I think it's about adapting and, and, and getting new technologies. And I think Drupal is Drupal and we, I mean, we're not running uh, from each other just if we are developing on different places as long as I think the code itself, the releases are indeed in, in Drupal, but in the, again, time will tell wh where, where we're moving and uh, where the community likes to, to develop. One thing that's somewhat, that's somewhat related to with that I've seen as a trend on with distributions in GitHub at Pantheon, we have this agency product where a sort of Drupal shop can have like an upstream uh, URL, and that's the sort of code they, they use to deploy. And we're seeing a lot of agencies that are creating distributions that aren't even install profiles, but are just like all of their like utility modules and their sort of custom set of what they do, and that they use GitHub to sort of manage that kind of thing. And I think that's a pretty cool trend for distributions because you can get out of a lot of the work of having to, you know, create a installs, like make it work, but you can have that common code base across a bunch of sites. And I think people find a lot of love because they're using a lot of other tech on GitHub and so they have that kind of experience. I think that's a positive, positive step. And another way to use a distribution that doesn't even involve an install profile, you just have that, that code you reuse uh, on every site. Yeah, and I don't necessarily think that um, feedback and collaboration coming from multiple channels is a bad thing. Um, I've seen a lot of Drupal people interacting in very issue queue-esque ways over Twitter, and that seems like it's pretty effective at times, getting people's attention, for example. Um, so if a pull request makes sense for some developers um, and mirroring uh, projects across multiple repos is the thing that we have to do, I think that I'm, pers I'm, a, I'm a proponent of as many tools as you know we need to get more people involved. So if some people are happy to post patches and other people are happy to post pull requests, um, you know, I'll accept whatever I can get as far as community collaboration is concerned. But it seems like it'd be a nice problem to have to have two issue queues to ignore. So uh, with that, some Q&A maybe? Let's go ahead and just, uh, if people have questions, we can line up on the mic.
And I think somebody's just going to have to propose a smart idea and then convince people to follow. Like, I, I, don't, I don't know how I would do it. Yeah, um, so I, I believe that, like, that's a good direction to go. Um, in Panoply, we have, like, a Panoply WYSIWYG that you could just install as a WYSIWYG on any site, regardless of other architecture. Uh, I think, though, given how cool that sounds, like, over the last five years, like, we're not seeing the killer, like, here's your photo gallery solution, here's your, you know, news press room solution. You, you know, there, yeah, there isn't an app store at Drupal. Um, and that sounds a little weird, because you'd hope that we'd have this reusability. I think one of the reasons for it is that, like, the Drupal development community is very focused on these sort of, like, the contrib modules that we have are very utility focused because you use them on a lot of sites. And that there just isn't a lot of incentive or focus on, like, I'm just going to build image, this really cool image gallery thing and maintain it because you don't get asked to build an image gallery that often. And in the case where you do, you're going to build a distribution around it. And so I think just it's just not part of the developer or contributor sort of workflow that they're constantly building a sort of like out of the box app like that. And I think that's one of the reasons we don't have a Drupal app store. So um, we're talking about Open Atrium, as you mentioned it before. Uh, that actually is something that we're looking to do. I think, um, kind of, for me personally, coming into Open Atrium 2.0, we really have learned so much since Open Public, and um, we do try to have a pretty clear idea of like it, what I would call extension points in the system, rather than sort of taking a distribution, sort of stamping on it, making your own, making it much easier to say, well, I just need this specific widget to be able to be added in, I need to be able to coordinate this. And I think there's an interesting stack that's emerged, uh, and we, I can show a little bit, we actually do have a module called apps that does let you have app store type stuff. Um, and Open Atrium and Open Public are both built on apps, and as we start looking at and kind of how, the, how that architecture is applied, it, it really does allow us to start thinking about how to make things that are reusable, and that's actually a much harder problem than you'd think. Um, you even mentioned it earlier, like, oh, it's a listing page. Uh, one of the things we found is that getting away from the concept of page into the concept of widget and letting the person build the pages out of the widgets is a great way for usability to actually be enabled. Nobody wants the page to look exactly the same, and everybody has their own ideas about theme and things like that, but being able to have these raw components that you can then place in the page and have them share the context and all that kind of stuff, that we found to be very powerful. And so as people start building on Atrium, it becomes about adding styles, adding widgets, adding apps, and much less about, hey, i got to make a module for this. It's a little bit more nuanced, but it does allow for much better reuse. And I think that, um, I don't know, it's, a, it's actually really exciting for me as an architecture because as we've seen it, it's like things like the, the media widget and you know media module being widgetized and everything else, it's, it has given us some of that reusability. And we're looking to bring that to open public as we move forward. Speaking of open atrium, Mike Potter, everyone. <laughs> And you have stodgy people like me that refuse to use anything like that. <laughs> Like 
Yeah, I, I typically, so in my issue submission guidelines, say, hey, like, you know, just so you know, we're not going to answer any support requests here. Post them to drupal.stackexchange.com instead. And so every day I go in and I close out several issues that were support requests and give them the link to drupal.stackexchange.com. So I think, I think it's the best tool for the job right now. You know, one thing that we've been doing, too, when with the Lightning distribution, when you go to the Lightning distribution project page, you're really downloading sort of an example of here's all of Lightning's features turned on and working. And, you know, we've been working on more documentation around this, but our basic sort of... Um, Rub here is that if you're building and you want to build something on top of Lightning, then the side project of the Lightning features, which contains all of the different little components, is something that you can include in your own install profile. And that's sort of the first step that we're sort of taking to go to that bridge. I think, you know, in the future, some of the stuff that we're looking at working on is an automated way to, you know, you don't necessarily want to just drop in all of the Lightning features and only turn on four of them. You might want to be able to deliver something through something like the apps um, system. So, you know, I think that, you know, in some ways we're working, you know, all separately and, and this kind of goes back to the last question about, you know, how we can come together and work, you know, more, you know, together on that sort of problem and I would, I would definitely like to see more of that, you know, going forward with, with especially in Drupal 8 and seeing how config is going to be managed and how we're going to be deploying stuff. I think it's, it, if we're going to survive and, and, and continue to grow, we definitely need to come together to, to figure out how we can collaborate more on fe things like features and work less on, you know, reinventing things. In theory, yes, we generate a patches.txt file. We could do all this. If Ryan was here, he could probably say, oh, yeah, I can do a query, and it'll like, give us all the stuff we need. Um, but uh, uh, that's an interesting idea. I like that idea because uh, right now the only way I know is when things pop up you know, on RTBC. Sometimes we used to use like commons love or mm -hmm. the commons yeah. issue queue uh, and do cod as the same thing. Because uh, that is difficult. I mean, honestly, I actually pretty much stalk all of you guys, all of your distributions, and look through your make files and see what cool things you're doing, and then put it into mine. So, um, you know, that, that's the I try to keep consistency, um, and and partially so that I can also test what you're doing. Um, but there is no automated way, and I think that would be awesome. So, thanks for the suggestion. Thanks, Mike. Uh, I think that's a good question to discuss. Um, I think people have different opinions on it. I think um, one trend, though, that I know is cutting against that is that, like, increasing amounts of companies are offering SaaS solutions for every different kind of thing on the Internet, and that sort of the consumer expectations around this stuff have grown immeasurably. That, you know, five years ago, you know, having a product in the box where you just turned it on and it did something was, that was sort of cool. Now people, you know, are like going to mint.com and getting all their financial stuff all in one place. And so when they look at a Drupal out of the box product, like it doesn't have that same polish. It doesn't have that same stuff. And so I think, you know, there maybe is a better way to say that because 
you know, at the end of the day, people aren't really getting, you know, an out of the box kind of thing. They're getting a tarball, so they still have to go install it somewhere. And that when they are start to run into problems, it's not like file a support request with the company and they'll, you know, give you info. It's you might have to write some code or, or do some stuff. But but I, I like to have a world where Drupal distributions are powerful. I think there's a like out of the box good solutions. I feel the hosting platforms have come a long way to have quick try or or go links. I just think we need the better utility functions in Drupal to provide that kind of edit in place and drag and drop experience that the consumers are now expecting given all this other SaaS stuff that's happened in the last five years. No, I mean, I think uh, I think it could be reasonable. I think like you can one click install Atrium, open Atrium on Pantheon. When there are new you know updates to Atrium, you get an email, you click a button, and it updates. I mean, it's it's not the same as SaaS where you don't really see that update process. You still are engaged with the code level, but you can you know, and many people do. Like Open Atrium is our most popular one click spin up on Pantheon. A lot of people spin it up, configure their way to a site, and they do do some maintenance, but you know. But it's hard because you know the like the, the tooling around the SaaS experience you know needs work, and that's you know part of what I think a lot of us are working on to try to try to build. But you know it's harder in Drupal than you know otherwise. Well, not only that, but it's it's Drupal too. So what I've seen a lot of you know problems that people run into is that you know people want to close deals with clients, so they provide to them this demonstration distribution, whatever it is, and they get started building with it, and throughout the whole cycle they're assured. It's still Drupal. You'll be able to customize it. You'll be able to turn off the things you don't want to use. And as soon as they start doing those sorts of things, then hitting the update button on something like Atrium could really break half their site. And so that's the point where it becomes, in my opinion, a bit of a client education and support team problem where they have to understand that they bought a website out of a box, but they went and took that box and built the Eiffel Tower out of it. And it's no longer... A cardboard box and so they need to understand that and and own it more than they do because they're not buying jive you know they're not buying this standalone product that can't be extended and as soon as they extend it it's like they've broken that license seal in a way and they need to understand that and edu and be educated on it and i think that the big travesty is when people aren't educated on that and they find that out after the fact and then they either walk away from drupal or using distributions at all because of that problem. So I think it's our responsibility as the maintainers to try to provide an upgrade path, but also try to provide components that are decoupled, ones that will work and in situations that are not always, you know, that are custom, not completely, you know, assume that we can just bomb people's sites with the way that our upgrade path works. And that's a really hard problem to solve. I don't think it's been completely solved, but I think it's something that definitely, it's great that you brought it up, and I think that that needs to be you know, out there and talked about much more. Yeah, I think, um, like you, you mentioned Atrium several times, so I'll just try to think. I mean, I think that when you talk about a SaaS offering, you talk about a product out of, boss, out of box, like what that even means, what people are thinking of five years ago with what a product was, something you could download and install and run, is very different now, where people are really thinking about subscriptions, and we have these examples of Salesforce and Office 365 and other things, even Photoshop is a subscription now. And so I think when we think about the experience of a product, I think that it's still very important to distributions, but I think we need to think about it a little differently. We need to realize that there's a, you know, there's a hosting angle, there's an installation in sort of the software itself, and there's a support angle. And that's one of the things at phase two, we've actually got a dedicated products team now that I happen to lead, and we're, we're there to help support people so we can give a little bit more of that SaaS experience. But I think it also goes with making sure as maintainers of distributions, we think about the learning curve and think about what can people do out of box and what are they going to have to learn and try to help guide them along that so that it's not just a cliff. <laughs> Uh, I have yet to see a distribution, an out-of-the-box product that was installed and didn't need some customization, some coding. So in terms of expectations, I agree that maybe we should write it somewhere or it should be somehow known that, yeah, some customization is needed. If you're a developer, go ahead. It's up to you. If you're a non-developer, you'll need to hire some service provider to customize it to you. But this uh, out-of-the-box 
don't touch it. It's uh, it's it's non-existent. It's a good story, but it's uh, I don't think it's it's for real. Yeah, so we're going to try to speed up because I think we're going to run over. So if, if if the question is long and involved, you know, we can definitely bow off afterward or whatever. But if if we think we can get through it quickly, let's try. Just go down the list, I guess. Um, so, we, uh, Mike and I were talking about this just recently because he actually got to spend a fair amount of time working on features for D8, which obviously is a really big, uh, a big thing for I think for all of us. <laughs> and what I would say is, uh, I am incredibly heartened being here at DrupalCon, hearing all of the module maintainers that we depend on so intimately to, you know, provide functionality that make our distributions work. That they all have plans and they're all looking forward to it. So. Um, we're watching it very closely. We're gonna, we're definitely gonna be going to D8. But as I mentioned when I was talking about the challenges, you know, you have core, which kind of then flows down to contrib, which then flows down to distributions, and we have to make sure that contrib, you know, core gets stable, so contrib can get stable, so that we can have a stable distribution. And so it'll take a little bit more time. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. Uh, yeah, for COD, uh, I think the way we're going is, you know, Drupal.org has a D8 upgrade path at some point that depends on contrib modules. But a lot of the stuff that we're using in uh, COD is also being used on Drupal.org. Mainly, we're trying to standardize the modules we're using. And so events.drupal.org, what LA and, and the future Drupal cons all use, is now COD. And so uh, we will have a D8 upgrade path, and it will probably happen after Drupal.org is upgraded, because once it's upgraded, most of the supporting modules for COD will be upgraded, and then we can spend our time on doing the specifics. Which one should answer? I didn't know Drupal 8, we started developing it. It's like something new. <laughs> so my approach is, um, well, I, I don't decide for all the distribution, but let's, let's say like this, like organic groups for it, uh, itself, which is a key, a key element, would be uh, upgraded. We've started, we've started that, uh, Roy Segal from Gizra started porting organic groups. He stopped because he wanted to port the message stack. He should go back to organic groups. Another thing that we're doing is also we're looking for a client that will sponsor some of the, the work because it's like, it's kind of a beast and I don't want to pay for all of it. So I'm looking for someone to do it. Uh, but eventually everything would be, uh, all our models would be um, upgraded, thus all the distribution could follow. Uh, no plans. Yet. <laughs> and we uh, have a Panoply boff in like 10 minutes to talk about, about those plans, so. Um, I think, yeah, I think as Doug said, a lot of the Drupal distributions, they do inherit so much from our things, so I think a lot of us are really looking at getting that contrib space upgraded and then getting our plans in place. Um, but we first need to get core released to, to, really, to, really, to really move that, that process forward more quickly. Yeah, we're, we're in a similar position. You know, we, we're looking to work on as much D8 stuff as we can and backport it also so that, you know, people that are looking to, to use these features and things like that are be able to move forward and have similar experiences. So the stuff that you see from Spark and stuff that you've seen in media for, for D8 that's been backported, you know, we've got Entity Embed, for example, in Lightning right now, and that came like a month ago. So we're, we're kind of in the process as it, as it is, and it's, it's interesting and to see what everyone is doing right now. I know that people are at DrupalCon right now working on the migrate patch that would make Commerce Kickstart work so that you can migrate CSVs as demo content, which is something that we adopted as a pattern and we're seeing in a lot of distributions. So it's all happening right now in, fr in front of us. Um, but, you know, it's going to take time. Cool. Well, thanks, everybody. And if we didn't have time for your question, I apologize. I know, you know, we're, we're, the next session is going to be starting in like a matter of seconds. So <laughs> thanks, everybody.